online economic forum. My name is Aritha Basu, and I am a staffer for Councilmember Mosqueda, and I'm so happy to welcome you all this morning. Um, shortly, we'll hear some opening remarks from Councilmember Mosqueda, and then we will move on to our first panel, which is on the economic realities, where we'll hear from experts like Josh Bivens, Research Director at the Economic Policy Institute, Lenore Palladino, Assistant Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the University of Massachusetts, Shah Habibi, Research and Policy Director in the Public Interest, Misha Workshaw, Executive Director of Budget and Policy Center, Derek Gruen, Co-Executive Director of Front and Center. After we hear from our first panel, we'll take a couple of questions and move on to our second panel that will focus on the community need, where we'll hear from Sean Van Eyck, Organizing Representative from Protect 17, Michelle Thomas, Director of Policy and Advocacy from the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, Pauline Echohawk, Executive Director of the Chief Seattle Club, and Bethel Yarse, Executive Director of Ventures. We'll take a couple of questions and then conclude our forum. We're very thankful for all of the panelists and everyone who is joining us today for this robust discussion. And with that, I will hand it over to Councilmember Mosqueda. Thank you so much, Aretha. It's really wonderful to see all of you. I hope you um, have had a chance to join us streaming live on YouTube. This is also going to be recorded for folks who want to watch it if they are working in grocery stores and the hospitals um, or taking care of family right now. We have recorded this economic forum as well. My name is Teresa Mosqueda. I'm a Seattle City Council member in position eight citywide. I'm the chair of finance and housing and the chair of the select budget committee. As we think about the opportunities that we have in front of us to respond to the COVID crisis, we know that much of the conversation in the last few days and weeks has focused on economic loss, economic pain, and how we are going to recover from this crisis. But as we focus on not just the economic crisis, I wanna center us first on the tremendous pain, grief, illness, and death that COVID has created right here in Seattle and across the globe. We know that the pain that these families and communities are facing is, um, is tremendous. And as of 5.30 p.m. last night, we saw the total confirmed deaths in Washington rise above 1,000 people. 1,002 deaths were recorded in Washington state. In King County, as of last night, there were 523 deaths. And there's around 18,611 people who've tested positive for COVID in Washington state. I think it's important that we remember the pain and suffering that is being caused on a physical and mental level, as well as an emotional level, and then begin talking about the economic pain. Much of the conversation that we've seen at the national level has been um, put into a political lens. And I think it's critical that we have a conversation that first recognizes we must address the public health crisis and then we can address the uh, economic crisis. And while we wait for appropriate testing, while we wait for there to be an appropriate vaccine, the crisis that is affecting our communities is hitting communities disproportionately. That is both in terms of the physical trauma and the economic trauma. We know that Latinos, for example, are four times as likely to be hospitalized due to COVID and two and a half more times likely to die because of COVID. We also know that people of color and women are higher, are, are uh, more likely to be working in the service sector industry without access to sick leave, without access to the appropriate PPE. And those who are deemed essential now are also the folks that have for many years been working at sub minimum wages and poverty wages. Before we talk about um, what happens in a recovery effort, I think it's also important that we center this discussion today on, an econ on the economic forum through the lens of not how do we build the economy that we used to have, but how do we build a new economy? Our previous economy that we had left far too many people out, especially women, people of color and immigrant populations. So as we think about who's being left behind, who's being most affected by this COVID crisis, I think it's imperative for us to think about what the new economy could look like. We're here today to talk with workers, small business um, advocates, families, nonprofits, our service sector employees, to talk about what it means to respond to the crisis, who's being affected on the front lines, what does this mean to um, have individuals who've been affected by the physical trauma of the COVID crisis and now to be hit twice as hard with the economic crisis. We want to make sure that we are both responding to the immediate crisis and also planning for the long-term crisis. We also have um, an opportunity to not just define responding to crisis in the next two months or three months, but to think about the immediate crisis in the next two to three years. 
We know at best a vaccine is probably not going to be available for 18 months or so. So thinking about responding to the current crisis must be framed in terms of this two to three year plan. And then longer term, what does it look like to rebuild an economy, a more equitable economy over the next five to 10 years? As we wait for a vaccine and the appropriate amount of testing, we want to make sure that we're mitigating the impact of the, of the economic crisis caused by COVID and recognizing that COVID has really just exposed cracks in our current social and economic system that has left far too many people out, created more, more vulnerable populations who are now experiencing the crisis um, tenfold over other populations. We have esteemed guests with us today at this economic forum, lo local and national experts. We will start with the macro perspective to help us put this economic crisis into perspective. We have local and national leaders who will talk about the magnitude of unemployment. What has the impact on small business closures? Who is profiting and who is shuttering due to this much needed stay at home and stay healthy order? We will hear from frontline folks, folks who are working directly with the community who've been most affected by the lack of housing, the lack of food assistance, lack of healthcare services, and lack of support for small businesses from the local to the national level. And we'll hear from them who is at risk from being further harmed by our existing cracks in the system and those that are being widened due to COVID. Colleagues, because this is a forum and not a public hearing, we do not have all of our council colleagues on the Zoom with us today, but I know many are watching on the live stream. I wanna thank my council colleagues who are with us, council member Sawant, who uh, is here with us. Thank you for being here and we'll hear from her immediately after the first panel before we go into questions. Uh, I also believe that we are going to be joined by council member Morales and council member Strauss. If there is another council member that joins us at a certain point, I'll let you know, um, but we probably will only have four members on at any time. I also wanna thank, uh, thank all of our IT folks and our communication folks who you've had the chance to see just as we joined the call. They've really made it possible for us to host this nationwide economic forum today. And for you also to be able to submit your questions in the viewing public, there was a link online and we are collecting those questions and we'll ask some questions in, in the, as soon as the panelists conclude. I'm extremely grateful for the panels that we have. So let's begin with our economic realities panel. We have first with us Josh Bivens, research director and from the Economic Policy Institute who will speak to us about the economic importance of resisting austerity measures. Josh, I'll turn it over to you. And you have about 10 minutes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna try quickly to share my screen and We'll see what happens. Um, does that work? Can people see it? It's working. It's the, and okay, excellent. Um, so I'll just say a couple things. One, we are facing the, the largest and most sudden economic shock probably in the history of the United States. It is decisively larger than the shock we faced during either the Great Recession of 2008 or even the Great Depression in terms of job loss. This first figure. Um, shows average five month job loss in the Great Recession, the Great Depression, and then what is forecast between February and July of 2020. And you can see that the job loss being forecast is greater by about two times as large as what we saw during the Great Depression. Um, and we're gonna hit that forecasted number. I mean, we've already seen about 35 million people file for unemployment insurance. Um, and so I think if anything, this is, this is a bit of an undershoot. Um, I think the unique features of this crisis are gonna put uniquely large demands on state and local governments in responding to this. Um, our state and local governments shoulder the disproportionate burden for lots of programs aimed at vulnerable populations like unemployment insurance. They do almost all education investment and they're on the front lines of healthcare. Um, and this is a very different recession, not only in its size, but also in the fact that it's falling first in low wage sectors, that's rare. Usually recessions start in manufacturing and construction and then radiate outward. This one has gone right at sectors that employ low wage workers disproportionately. Um, also unusually, this recession has really been led by a drop in healthcare spending. Basically any medical procedure that is not COVID related just has stopped over the past two or three months. That's gonna have long-term consequences on people's health, but it also, healthcare is a huge part of the economy. It has led to a slowdown in that sector. Um, and finally, this crisis has shut down schools which has led to a host of challenges for working parents as well as for, for education generally. Um, so I think one thing we wanna look at, sorry, just to, there we go, um, advanced 
slide one. This is just showing the share of households that have experienced a layoff or furlough or reduced hours since March 1st by income level. Basically households um, with combined income of less than $40,000, almost 40% 40 of them have seen a member lose a job, be furloughed or had their hours reduced compared to just 13% of households where the combined income is over 100,000. So this really shows that the epicenter of this crisis is in the low wage sector. Um, I think as well, this is a um, slide showing you forecast sort of changes in GDP over the next couple of quarters and through the end of 2021. Um, there's a couple things to, to note about this. That blue line at the top is sort of the pre-crisis trend of gross domestic product, which is basically total national income. And then there's two forecasts on here, one by Goldman Sachs, one by CBO. They both show about the same pattern. And there's a couple things to note about this forecast. One, you know, it's an incredibly sharp contraction, like right now in the data, the second quarter of this year. Two, it's got a pretty robust recovery in the second half of this year. And then three, even with that recovery, which I think is a little driven by rosy assumptions in some ways I'll talk about, we end at the end of 2021, 18 months from now, essentially in these projections, essentially sitting at a place that is about the worst of where we were during the Great Recession. Sort of the, the jargon is the you know, output gap. It's how much actual GDP departs from what we could be producing if we were actually at full employment and we had not had this crisis. But essentially, these projections are showing us that 18 months from now, we'll you know have the great opportunity of sitting about where we were in 2009. And that should be really distressing. That should make us think we need to do more on the policy front. Um, so in terms of the, the rosy assumptions sort of embedded in this robust second half recovery in this graph, I think there's two. One, you know, I think we've all become amateur epidemiologists over the past couple of months trying to read everything we can about this crisis. And I, what I have gathered from what I've read is it is not just a one and done binary, everyone's sitting in their homes for three months and then it's all back to normal. That, that's not what I'm reading from the public health experts. Um, I think the return to economic activity is going to be much more gradual and phased th than that. Um, and it also is sort of assuming there's, there's no localized rolling set of shutdowns and second waves. And I think that could be a real threat to, to growth going forward. Um, I think what that means is a couple things for the policy uh, choices in front of us. One, we cannot spend enough money on public investment to get a hold of this crisis relative to the economic damage we're seeing in charts like this. Essentially, the tool we've chosen so far to deal with the crisis is a complete shutdown of economic activity. I think it was necessary to stop the sort of really rapid growth. Going forward, we can choose a different path. We can choose a more strategic one. that is lots of testing, tracing, isolation, mask wearing. We can do that instead of total shutdowns. This more strategic approach is, is expensive, but even the most expansive sort of testing proposals and things like that out there basically say they might cost $100 billion. Well, in the second quarter of this year, just in April, May, and June of this year, we're going to lose $2 trillion. So even the most robust public investment response to do a strategic approach to this crisis will not even cost 5% of what a total shutdown costs in just three months of this year. So this says we should spend everything we need to spend on the public front to get a handle on this crisis. Two, I think the other big issue we need to think about is that the path of recovery is going to rest on the generosity of our relief and recovery measures. Um, the more generous we are with relief and recovery, the more likely it is that households will emerge from the economic shutdown, able to actually unleash pent up demand that will get businesses back up and running quickly um, on their feet and hiring. And we haven't done enough relief and recovery yet. And the single biggest place we've fallen short is in um, failing to give substantial federal aid to state and local governments on the scale they need. Um, state and local revenues are extremely sensitive to business cycles. Best estimates are for every one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate nationally is associated with about a 45 to $60 billion shortfall in state and local revenues. And we're looking at unemployment that will peak at about 25% or more in the summer. It might be still sitting above 9% at the end of 2021. This is just gonna put huge downward pressure on state and local revenues. This is just a scatter plot showing that on the uh, horizontal axis, as unemployment rises, state and local revenues predictably fall. This is sort of what is heading in front of us. Given the path of unemployment forecast, there are estimates that the shortfall for state and local governments by the end of 2021 is going to be about a trillion dollars. This is not implausible at all. It might even be higher. Um, 
what happens if we don't do enough federal aid and just allow these revenue shortfalls to mix with balanced budget rules to put savage downward pressure on spending? Um, we know what's going to happen. We kind of did this experiment during the recovery from the Great Recession. We allowed state and local governments to just hang out in the wind with insufficient aid, and they just became relentless anti-stimulus machines during that recovery and dragged down growth. Um, you look, I'm going to skip ahead one to, this is state and local spending growth after the Great Recession compared to every other recovery since World War II. That outline red line at the bottom is what happened after the years 2009. We had the most austere state and local spending recovery on record. And it depressed growth enough that basically we didn't reach 2007 levels of unemployment after the Great Recession until a decade later, 2017. If we had instead allowed state and local governments to just do the normal path of recovery rather than throttling it with austerity, we would have had a return to pre-crisis unemployment by 2013. We delayed recovery for four years only through the state and local spending austerity that this graph shows. Um, and it makes sense. State and local governments are the single largest employer in the US economy. They spend about $4 trillion a year. If you throttle them, you are throttling the economy not just in the valuable services they provide, but also just the generalized economic health. So I think going forward from here, there's a lot of things we need to do on the policy front. One key thing is relief and recovery, whether it's aid to state and local governments or unemployment insurance or all the other things we do, it should respond to economic conditions, not arbitrary dates. Right now, lots of the relief and recovery we passed, it just ends at the end of July or the end of December. I showed you that graph earlier. The economic distress does not end at the end of July or the end of December. We should have that relief and recovery continue, be based on triggers and economic conditions. That, that's a key thing left to do. But the single biggest thing left to do at the federal level is we need to help state and local governments navigate this crisis and address their shortfalls. And then finally, one last thing, and then I'll end. Um, Congress may well disappoint. It would not be the first time. And so they may not give state and local governments what they should be given to help navigate this crisis. You know, state and local governments are very constrained, um, but they're not completely without agency. And so if the choice becomes, do I protect the valuable public services that this spending provides and the employment it provides, or do I protect the low tax rates of our highest income households and corporations? I, I think the choice there is obvious. I think it's going to drag on growth much, much less if you raise revenue, especially raise revenue in a progressive way and preserve as much spending as possible throughout this recovery. We see this in the data. In 2010, the states that had sort of a Republican takeover at the state and local level made very different choices than other states, and they cut spending. They actually cut taxes at the same time, but cut spending enough to actually balance the budget on the backs of services and public sector employment, and their economy suffered. Their unemployment rate took longer to recover. Their jobs did not grow as fast. So I, I think we've got you know, obvious choices in front of us. The first choice is at the federal level. They need to do something to step up to help address this $1 trillion shortfall coming our way. Um, and then at the state and local level, if we do not get enough federal aid, they need to make tough choices in front of them. And the choices really should be avoid the austerity on the spending side that was so damaging to growth the last time we had an economic crisis. Um, and from there, um, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm happy to answer questions after the other panelists speak. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Josh. Again, Josh Bivens, Research Director from the Economic Policy Institute. Thank you for sharing your slides and the cautionary tale about the consequences of austerity. Um, the next person that we have is going to be Lenore Palladino. Before we turn it over to Dr. Palladino, I want to say thank you to Councilmember Morales, who's joined us. And I know Councilmember Herbold is watching as well. Thank you, colleagues. Again, we're asking folks to hold their questions until the panelists um, have had a chance to share their remarks, and then we'll have some Q&A. Dr. Palladino, uh, thank you so much for being with us. And thanks to Councilmember Sawant for, for referring you to us. Dr. Palladino is Assistant Professor of Economics and, Pu and Public Policy at University of Massachusetts. Thanks for being here with us to discuss what the federal economy looks like pre-COVID, what it looks like now, and what future projections are. Um, and again, appreciate you being here with us today. Great, how's my sound? Great. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate, Councilmember Mosqueda, and, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, all Americans need public investment, not austerity, in the midst of this economic emergency. And I want to make two brief points about how we achieve economic resiliency in this moment and going forward. 
The first is again, as, as I think Josh just so eloquently laid out, why we need to avoid austerity in this fragile moment, why the choices we make now are so determinative for the next couple of years. And the second point I want to make is why a corporate tax is fair and likely is a necessary part of economic resiliency going forward. So first, just briefly, I'll really um, echo a lot of what Jess just said about this current moment and why it's so important to avoid austerity. You know, families like yours in Seattle, mine in Massachusetts, all of us across America have stopped working and consuming in the effort to keep us all safe. And for anyone who's taken an introductory macroeconomics class like mine, we know that public investment is crucial and necessary to stabilize an economy and not allow families to descend into poverty and fear. As Josh said, the recent experience of the Great Recession shows us plainly that austerity does not work. If states and cities slash spending, rather than finding ways to stabilize revenue, we'll see, un you know, last time unemployment took a decade to recover, it could take much longer this time, and that would be devastating. Prolonged unemployment should be our greatest economic fear. When people aren't working, they don't buy goods and services, and the economy can get stuck in that low gear. So the responsibility of public policymakers in this kind of moment is to look for ways to invest in the local economy in times of economic need. So what I want to do is really talk about one way to address the shortfall and why I think that fair corporate taxation is a productive and equitable public policy approach to the current crisis. So fair corporate taxation should be part of a strategy to ensure that states and cities have the resources they need to meet this economic moment. We'll hear later in this panel from other uh, distinguished panelists about the tremendous need. So I'll defer on that for a moment and I'll talk about one of the best ways to raise revenue right now by raising uh, equitably corporate taxes. The key things economists consider when evaluating tax proposals is how the entity or person being taxed will respond to the tax. Will they behave differently? Will they make different economic decisions about how they produce goods and services or who they hire as a result of the tax? So that's really the key question we need to answer when we think about how do you raise revenue in this moment? So it's important to remember, large corporations have seen their taxes go down for years, particularly after the 2017 federal tax reform, the very badly named Tax Cuts, tax cuts for Jobs Act, TCGA, uh, that reform reduced the federal corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. Going into the crisis, plenty of large corporations had made record, record profits for years while building up large cash holdings and taking on record debt. For example, corporations nationally earned $1.9 trillion in profits after tax in just the fourth quarter of 2019. Part of the reason why American workers were just so financially fragile going into this crisis is that corporations are spending their profits rewarding shareholders rather than investing in their workforce. Uh, for example, American corporations spent $6.3 trillion with a T on stock, buy stock buybacks in the last decade alone, propping up their own stock prices and wasting money for everyone except those who cashed out before the market fell. A common justification for squeezing worker wages is that companies need every dollar to raise share prices. This is part of why, again, American workers had so little cushion leading up to the moment when the pandemic hit. So let's remember again that this lower corporate tax two years has meant the, an estimated $750 billion uh, in lower tax burden for corporations is projected for the next 10 years. So that brings us to today. What can we do? What can public policymakers do to raise the much you know, badly needed revenue we're going to need to avoid austerity? The corporate tax rate currently proposed for large corporations in Seattle, a 1.3% tax, in my view, is unlikely to change the behavior of these large corporations. There's simply too much profit that can continue to be made from ongoing corporate activity. While the data is not transparently available to determine which corporations would be subject to the tax, it's clear that Amazon would be taxed. So let me talk for a moment about Amazon, just to again paint this picture of how corporations are doing and why these kinds of uh, tax rates might not change their behavior very much. We know that Amazon is growing in this time of national crisis as millions of Americans shop more online than ever before. News is coming out that Jeff Bezos is a soon to be trillionaire, but I think it's more important to actually look at Amazon's actual, uh, actual funds themselves. According to Amazon's most recent filings, their net sales were $75 billion in the first quarter of 2020, which was up from $59 billion in the first quarter of 2019. So they've been uh, seeing you know, real growth in this time of crisis. They have $221 billion in assets 
And we know that their, their wealth is going to continue to grow as people look for ways to avoid going out to stores. They can afford to continue the same production and profit-making activity if subject to a small municipal tax. They're unlikely to cut back on hiring and expansion when there's strong demand for their services. And after all, we can remember that just two and a half years ago, they were paying a much higher federal rate and they continue to expand and grow their productive capacity. So bottom line, small corporate taxes are an equitable way uh, to raise badly needed revenue from the entities that are least likely to change their behavior as a result of the tax. And fair corporate taxation to support collapsing city and state budgets is a key part of the equation for surviving the pandemic. Thanks very much for having me. Dr. Palladino, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, and just want to note for folks, uh, given that this is a public forum, we're not talking about a specific bill. I took your example to be a great example of doing the math on a small corporate tax. So I thank you for extrapolating uh, that for us so that we had a real life experience to walk through um, on this economic forum. Your math is very much appreciated. And I think it also shows um, sort of where the wealth was prior to COVID and where it will continue to be in post COVID world. So I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, the next presenter that we have is Shar Habib, uh, Habibi, a research pol and policy director for In the Public Interest, who will discuss research and show how we can center public investments that promote equity, transparency, and progressive values. Welcome and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to try to share my screen as well. Let's see um, if we can make that happen. There we go, does everybody see that? Okay, perfect. Okay, so centering equity in public goods in the current crisis. Um, I'm gonna get back down to basics um, for a minute and talk about definitions. So what are public goods? We keep talking about public goods, public investments, what do we mean? Um, this isn't the formal economics definition, but I think it gets at the heart of what we mean when we say public good. Um, and the conditions that we've come up with are, one, the things that we can only do if we do them together, like, you know, clean the air, ensure everybody has quality health care. Um, the things that we all benefit from, regardless of whether we use the specific service or asset, such as public education. Um, the things that protect and support us all, like safe food, social security, Medicare, and then lastly, the things that make us a fairer, a better, fairer, more compassionate and more democratic nation. And so what are some examples of public goods? You know, public education, public transit, healthcare, clean water, um, public infrastructure like roads and water treatment plants. Also things like green space and parks and um, clean community via things like regular trash pickup. Um, and larger things like economic security, which programs like social security would fall under. So I think one of the major issues that has come to the forefront of many people's minds during the current crisis that we're all living through is the long-term disinvestment in an in, in, in equitable provision of public goods. So for example, it's become glaringly obvious that there are public goods such as healthcare or social safety net, um, emergency planning, uh, internet access um, that the US doesn't have or not everybody has access to. And we're seeing very up close the consequences on so many people's lives due to the lack of these public goods. Um, I think public goods are a direct reflection of our country's values. And we can see during this pandemic that public goods like public health and economic security are incredibly important to everyone's lives, um, but they're lacking. Um, and so we've seen the impacts of these types of policy decisions in the current COVID crisis with health agencies and unemployment, the unemployment insurance systems, um, both of which have been severely hobbled due to austerity budget cuts during the Great Recession and continued funding cuts since then. Um, I mean, these are public goods that are vital in stemming the health and economic consequences of the pandemic, um, but they've been gutted to the point where in many places they're unable to adequately fulfill their mission. So you'll see two very recent headlines that I cropped into this slide. Um, one is from the LA Times, 
um, you know, how budget cuts and restrictive policies hobble the unemployment insurance system. The other one's from the Washington Post, health agencies funding cuts challenge coronavirus response. So I think these cuts have had really real impacts on our collective ability to weather this crisis. But I think that the health crisis has also created an opportunity to push back against messages of austerity during a crisis and instead push forward with a new, version, a new vision of government that provides robust public goods to everyone. Um, what's interesting is, he, you know, you saw the headlines on the previous slide. On this slide, these are some other recent headlines that show, um, you know, some journalists and some other writers introducing, you know, some new ideas around public goods and services into American minds. Um, the small era of small government is over. Um, the how the, the pandemic could change how the Amer how Americans view government. Um, I think my, one of my favorites is from um, Nicole Hannah-Jones. And she says, I never wanna hear that government should be run like a business. This crisis has laid bare the dangers of gutting our public institutions and services of depending on companies dedicated to profit rather than government mandated to work for the common good. Death is the result. I mean, I think that's very eloquently stated. Um, I, and I, th I think the quote encapsulates some of the changing attitudes that this crisis has brought about. Sorry, let me just adjust my screen here. Um, so let's take a look at austerity. I think I'm not saying anything new that our other panelists haven't said, um, but I think that, that this, you know, when we talk about austerity, the, it's the idea that the government should severely cut spending as a primary way of dealing with an economic downturn. And this is a starve the beast approach. It doesn't lead to improved economic conditions, but instead leads to inadequate resources to meet public needs, which then kind of reinforces an anti-government sentiment by presenting government as the problem. Um, and it, an austerity approach uses budget deficits as justification for launching an assault on vital public programs. Um, and it can threaten to create a fiscal austerity cycle where growth declines, thereby lowering tax revenues, and then necessitating more austerity. Um, I pulled this chart from um, some 2012 research that the Center for American Progress um, did. And, and it was right at the time in 2012, states were, were in the midst of recovery from the Great Recession. And they examined how state spending affects economic outcomes. And it's, they divided states into two groups what, based on whether they expanded or cut public spending at the start of the Great Recession. Um, so in that first chart, you see that blue line represents states that expanded spending and the red line is states that cut spending. And you can see in that first chart how the spending decisions greatly diverged over time. And in all of the other charts, you'll see that states that expanded spending did substantially better on indicators of economic health. Both the expenditure cutting and expenditure expanding states saw big rises in unemployment rates, um, as you can see in that second chart. Um, but it shows that, that on average, states that cut spending fared substantially worse with unemployment rates rising faster and higher than in states that expanded spending. Um, that third chart on the bottom left um, examines private sector employment, and it shows that increased spending on public services and investments delivered a boost to the private sector that helped private employment also better weather the economic downturn. And then that last chart um, that examines economic growth shows that states that expanded spending progressed well ahead of their pre-recession growth rates, while states that cut spending um, had much slower growth than before the recession. So I think the larger point um, that, you know, that other panelists have made as well is that public spending on public goods can make a big difference in contributing to a robust recovery and a fragile economy like we're experiencing now um, can be boosted by increased public spending on public goods. 
And then lastly, I wanna conclude by discussing a few ideas about re rebuilding a strong economy. Um, so we know that austerity isn't the answer. Um, and so what is? And I think a few, few thoughts come to mind. Um, first is that public intervention is the only way to solve this crisis. You know, the market won't solve it on its own. Corporations won't solve it on its own, nor will individuals. Second, we must reject trickle down, you're on your own economic theory. I think the crisis has shown that we're all in this together and that must be reflected in how we make our way out of the crisis on both the health and the economic fronts. Um, third, we, the people in the, you know, in the people in the community, we are the economy. So there must be large investments in public goods to meet people's health and economic stability goals. And I'm gonna add, I'll take a moment just to add real quick that we're already seeing that corporations are using this moment of crisis to expand their bottom lines. Um, my organization does a lot of um, monitoring of privatization. Um, and we've seen that uh, many cities and states are facing privatization threats. Um, and so increasing corporate power will not help us get out of this crisis that has largely been fueled by inequality. And then lastly, public goods must promote shared prosperity in, and equality, um, centering the needs of people, especially those who were already vulnerable or on the margins. So I will um, stop at that and pass it on to the next panelist. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the presentation um, and the, the great examples of where people didn't do the type of austerity cuts and how that benefited the private sector as well. That's a great takeaway. Thank you. Our next presenter is Misha Worshful, Executive Director for Budget and Policy Center. Before we turn it over to Misha, I just wanna say thanks to Council Member Strauss, who is also watching on YouTube. Appreciate you um, being there and um, weighing in as well um, when you can. Uh, we have Misha Worshful, who's the Executive Director, Budget Policy Center, our state and as our state and local economy um, thinks about recovering from this recession. What lessons learned do you see from the past, looking at local efforts and state efforts that you've been involved in? When we know just this last legislative session, some of our legislative champions said that they only began to fill the holes that were created 10 years ago. Thank you for providing any thoughts about how we um, can learn those lessons and apply them now before it becomes too late. Thank you so much, um, Council Member Mosqueda, um, and to folks listening in and uh, participating in this conversation. My name is Misha Wershkel. I'm the Executive Director of the Washington State Budget and Policy Center. We're a nonpartisan research and policy organization focused on building a stronger and more equitable Washington state. Um, as I talk today, I think I'll be able to hopefully take some of the national picture and the lessons from the three speakers who preceded me and try to bring that to what that means for Washington State. And just want to focus really on three kind of key takeaways. First is that the period of economic growth in our state that preceded the COVID-19 crisis really masked key structural issues. Um, those include extreme economic inequality, in an inadequate public investment and a regressive state and local tax code. The second point is that the last recession and the recovery period had devastating impacts on the long-term economic security of Washingtonians. And this recession is likely going to be significantly worse unless policymakers act quickly. And the third is that there is a path forward that prioritizes public health, puts the needs of low and moderate income Washingtonians first, and sets us on a path to an equitable recovery. So first, just focusing on the period before the COVID-19 recession um, and the economic and public health crisis that we're facing. Um, actually, I forgot I was gonna share my screen. Sorry about that. Let me do that really quickly. No problem. Thank you so much for getting some slides for us. And they are popping up. Thank you so much, Misha. Um, 
So the period uh, before the COVID-19 crisis was one really marked by a significant number of individuals and households in Washington state experiencing extreme economic uncertainty. And just remember, I'm looking historically, during the Great Recession, there was a significant loss of wealth for many households, particularly households of color. And the economic recovery that came after that recession was one that really wasn't experienced as an economic recovery for many Washingtonians. In fact, during that recovery, poverty rates rose sharply, um, and particularly the number of families in deep poverty increased in our state. Actually, 15,000 additional families were moved into deep poverty during the time period of the supposed economic recovery. Um, those hardships were particularly felt by families of color, um, including Black Washingtonians um, and Hispanic and Latino Washingtonians. And since that period, we know that the gains in income growth really have gone and been concentrated among the very wealthiest. Um, there's a lot of different statistics on this, but we know that a significant portion of Washingtonians um, actually have said that they would not have been able to afford covering a $400 emergency um, using cash or savings, even in the time period of economic growth and expansion leading into this crisis. During that time period, um, public investment really did not keep pace with our economy. So you see in the chart that I'm showing, um, kind of tracking our state tax revenue as a share of personal income. Since the, the Great Recession, the um, tax revenue as a share of personal income has not actually recovered back to the levels of the pre-recession. And this is really important because what it means is that we entered this crisis in a place where our investments in public schools, healthcare, public health, and other pr public services that others have talked about really were not um, meeting the needs of Washingtonians um, and actually weren't back at the levels of the pre-recession. Um, and one really significant reason for this is that Washington state has the most regressive tax code in the country, where low income Washingtonians pay around seven times more a share of their income in state and local taxes than the wealthiest. And you can see that these two things are related. As we have an economic recovery where income um, gains are going to the wealthiest in our state um, and low income people are falling further and further behind and a state tax code that really is built on paying for public investments through the lowest income Washingtonians, it becomes clear why the state investments have not been able to keep pace with the needs of our communities. Um, I'll also just note when we look at our tax code, I think it's really important to note we usually look at this by income level and that's really important, but it's also true that communities of color are concentrated among the lower income brackets. And so we know that our tax code is um, disproportionately impacting communities of color. We have the distinction of Washington state, in fact, of having the highest effective tax rate for undocumented immigrants in the country. Um, and so we know that we have public systems and public investments that are really important, but are built really and funded by the lowest income people in our communities. So the second kind of overall point I want to make really um, dovetails to the speakers before, which is really comparing kind of what the situation was in the Great Recession to the current um, current recession that we're experiencing. And as Josh Bivens talked about at the beginning, you know, it's very tempting to compare these two things because up until a few months ago, the Great Recession was considered the greatest economic crisis that we've had since the Great uh, depression. Um, but once you look at the numbers, you can see that there are some similarities and there are also some key differences. So I'll just kind of illustrate some of those for Washington State. So um, when we talk about just the overall economic contraction, you can see, you know, a 4% decline during the Great Recession, a much more significant decline expected in this recession. Um, jobs lost in Washington State during the Great Recession, our unemployment rate peaked at a high number of 10.4%. Um, but now estimates, actually, this is an estimate from the Economic Policy Institute that I think has now been updated and is much higher, um, but is estimated to reach 15, potentially up to 20, 25% unemployment. Um, demand for public service, it makes sense, as other folks have spoken to this as well, that as you know, folks' incomes are falling, as people are losing their jobs, they turn to public systems to provide support. And in the Great Recession, programs like um, food assistance, the SNAP program was a really critical lifeline. And at the peak of the economic uh, crisis, one in seven Americans were actually enrolled in food assistance. 
Um, but we've seen even an unprecedented demand for public services in this moment. Over a million Washingtonians um, filing for unemployment, doubling of demand for state cash and food assistance. You know, when you think about the unemployment numbers for Washington State, I think it's important there, the numbers are big. And just to put them in context, it's as if Century Field has been filled 15 times over the past two months with people who have lost their job. Um, so very significant, more than one in five Washingtonians filing for unemployment. And we know that the true unemployment numbers are higher than this because of people who are excluded from the unemployment insurance system, like undocumented immigrants who pay into unemployment insurance, but aren't able currently to see the benefits. Um, and then you talk about the state and local budget impacts. During the Great Recession, there was more than $10 billion in state budget cuts. Um, every area of state and local government cut during that recession. Some of the um, pain that sticks in my mind is 70,000 low-income adults being cut off of health care during an economic crisis, tuition at four-year colleges doubling, 20,000 families losing cash assistance provided through the temporary assistance for needy families, and 18,000 state and local government jobs lost. And I think the other presenters have made it clear why these type of cuts have really um, led to the type of uneven and slow economic recovery that we experienced in Washington state um, and really prolonged the harm for Washingtonians. Um, we know catastrophic shortfalls are on the horizon. This crisis is still developing, but you can see some of the estimates um, that we expect for Washington State. Um, so I'll close with just sharing um, my third point, whoops, which is that there is a path forward that would be um, really center the public health of Washingtonians and get our economy on a path to recovery. We developed at the Budget and Policy Center a set of five principles that was informed by conversations with many partners that we're using to guide our work in this moment and hope will provide a guide to policymakers. Um, really just drawing your attention, they're on the screen, but to two, um, one is the need to provide, a, or the second principle is to provide immediate, impactful, and sustained relief. This crisis hit folks very quickly, hit our state very quickly, and policymakers need to act equally quickly to really provide the relief that Washingtonians need. Um, and it's really all levels of state government. It's tempting to wait for the federal government to try to um, respond to this crisis, and certainly we need to work on that. But it's our state and local governments, too, that need to keep money moving in our economy um, and really get our economy back um, moving as um, the, as the um, as folks are back out um, in the economy again. And then I'll just highlight the fifth principle, which for us is rejecting a scarcity mindset. This has been touched on by other speakers as well, but just recognizing that, you know, this um, economic crisis isn't impacting all Washingtonians equally. And we are blessed in this state to have significant wealth um, and a significant ability to invest back in the people and in our economy. Um, and so the mechanics of how to do that and what that looks like is a topic um, for many, many conversations, but we'll just acknowledge that this is something that in our state we really can afford. Um, actually, I think in every state we can afford um, to meet the needs of people in this moment. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Misha Wershful, again, Executive Director from the Budget and Policy Center here in Washington State. Uh, thank you for the reminder and the contrast between the Great Recession and what we can expect with this COVID crisis and just beginning to emerge. Um, we have uh, one more speaker, and I know, Misha, you may have to run due to another meeting scheduled at noon. We really appreciate you being here just in case you drop off. Um, our next speaker and last speaker for this panel will be Derek Gruen, co-executive director for Front and Center, who will discuss strategies to create equitable, equitable economies, building a democratic economy um, as part of our goal as we think about what rec recovery could look like. Thank you so much for being with us, Derek. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm gonna share some slides here. Um, so, uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, I'm the co-executive director of Front and Centered, which is a coalition of more than 60 groups statewide that are rooted in communities of color and work together to equitably transition our state towards our vision of climate justice. I also help steward a project called the People's Economy Lab, which is a group of Seattle community leaders building more democratic, resilient, and equitable models for community business for generating and allocating capital and for land and commercial space ownership. And I mentioned that all because I'm gonna be bringing forward ideas from these communities that 
may see the and experience the economy a little bit uh, different from you know a traditional economist perspective. I want to start with a, a very high level conversation about what do we mean by our economy. Often we can jump right into the the data without actually considering um, what are the key pillars of what we what we consider an economy. And this is a framework from a group called Movement Generation. It's a simple way to explain that you know. At, at a broad level, what we are doing in an economy is taking resources, applying work uh, towards some purpose. What we talk about less often is this is guided by an underlying worldview and a system of governance that really helps shape and determine these outcomes. And often we let these things proceed kind of in the same way they did yesterday with, uh, without questioning that these are actually decision points. And I want to, in particular, take up the council members' challenge about how we think about building a new economy from this moment, um, building on kind of all the, the data, what are the things that we can do, and what are the choices we can make in each of these basic pillars of an economy. In many ways, our economy is no different than it was four months ago. We're stuck in this precarious economic model that depends on the generation of income and wealth from a few large businesses and individuals that trickles down to the rest of us. It's a model that has caused displacement and homelessness, increasing wealth disparities and has fueled the climate crisis. Uh, it's an economy in which you know, stocks have been climbing while jobs are being lost and that has failed to kind of ensure the basic safety of our residents in Washington and across the state and the world. But of course, what has radically changed is the conditions we live in within this economic system. Uh, we face a triple threat from COVID-19 to our environmental health, because we can't operate in physical space the same way, to our democracy with growing misinformation and exploitation of divisions within society, and obviously an economic threat in a massive reorganization of the way we've been able to consume and to make a living. So, um, within those threats, it's clear that everyone is at risk, but because of historic and persistent unjust policies and institutions, some communities, particularly often communities of color, or those without documentation or with different abilities or lack of historic family wealth, are more vulnerable and more exposed. Uh, poor air quality, voter suppression, lack of access to affordable capital are all pre-existing wounds that COVID is now festering in and exposing. So going back to our kind of basic model of the economy, I think there are two stories we're being told. One is the story is about scarcity uh, that is really rooted in fear. And this is the story that's brought us xenophobia and redlining. It has told us that there's not enough. Uh, it's held us back time and time again, telling us what we cannot do. And the other story is one of abundance and opportunity that is acknowledges there is a surplus, as Misha just mentioned in our state, and there is enough to go around. It's just about how we choose to allocate that surplus. That's confident that we can prosper because of our strengths, um, that we succeed when we're together, and that when we prioritize equity in collective action, everyone can prosper. And I want to keep those stories in mind because the worldview often dictates our decisions in a way that's not always apparent. We hear a lot of talk about recession as an economic threat, but recession is, is really just a, a measure of aggregate production and consumption. And in all the community conversations I've been a part of, I've never had anyone tell me that what they need is higher aggregate consumption and production. What I do hear about is closing the racial wealth gap. I've been hearing about healthcare and environmental health, how we value our community businesses and want to be able to stay and thrive in our neighborhoods. And now more than ever, we need an economy of purpose that's targeted towards these shared values by design, not as an afterthought. And we must aim for a recovery that builds the well being of people in place, but with a specific focus on the communities most impacted that face the greatest historic and current barriers to meet their fundamental needs. Another core element of actually succeeding in building this new economy is, to act to is the system of governance that we operate under. We need to ensure that the people most impacted are at the center of decision-making. Um, many of our public processes are set up for equal opportunity to participate, but in this time, in this crisis, we know that um, the impacts are not equal. And how do we provide proportionate access to 
influencing these decisions that are coming, the policymaking in response to COVID to the impacts. Those closest to the problem are often in the best position to really identify proper solutions. Uh, at the heart of our economy is our work, not just the work we do as individuals, but really our, our ability to, to make collective action and how we apply resources um, and allocate them. Um, other speakers have already called on the need for a increased focus on public goods, on collective provision of basic needs. It's been 75 years since uh, President Franklin Roosevelt introduced the idea of a second Bill of Rights, of an economic Bill of Rights, the right to work and sufficient income, to housing and to health care, among other things we've come to expect, like education and social security. Right now, I think that call is uh, more relevant than ever. But to do this, we actually need to move money. Uh, we need to make public investments um, because we know that disproportionately low wage workers have lost their jobs and disproportionately high wage or higher income workers have been able to keep them and for some even grow their earnings. Uh, and this is an extremely dangerous and unstable situation that we, we rely on government to address. But it's not just about public investments. Public investments are the anchor but it's also about moving the existing wealth within our communities. How do we localize money that has been, you know, going to Wall Street right now uh, in our government and our tax revenues in private wealth to bring it back home to invest in our communities? Now might be the time, for example, for a city or state bank that help, can help do that. At the same time, we need to take a larger look at um, the work we're doing um, as individual business to build more democratic and equitable models of making a living. As a baseline starting point, we need to ensure that all workers have COVID health services and workplace safety. But we also need to really emphasize and see the importance of care work right now. Uh, it's taking the brunt of the impacts from the COVID uh, economic crisis as well as the health crisis. The need for care work is, an explo is exploding. We need to put an emphasis on care work at the heart of our recovery. And we need to think about how we better distribute the work that exists there's plenty of work to go around, but how do we match the work that needs to be done with the workers who need work? Um, we also need to think about and invest in our community businesses that have for too long been out on their own as individual entrepreneurs, often um, entrepreneurs of color with less access to capital and technical assistance um, that are really anchors in our community. And um, how do we share the risk with those anchors that are key to communities how do we redirect the procurement of major institutions as we've seen some evidence of localizing supply chains, um, larger institutions supporting our smaller community businesses as a way to keep our economy going. And the last piece is, is our an, an emphasis on resources and, and what resources we apply in our community. And in, in our city, we have um, some powerful uh, controls like um, the ability to regulate land use. How do we use all of our tools to avoid a speculative land rush um, that capitalizes on foreclosures or inability to make rent payments um, and instead to move to more uh, housing and commercial space out of the speculative market into trust or public and community control? We need to be watching this sector as well. And how do we use our community-based organizations that are connected to place, that are connected to community and are filling gaps in traditional systems like unemployment to make sure that nobody um, is left out. We need to invest in those community-based organizations. And we need to ensure, you know, as another speaker mentioned, um, those public goods include things like clean water, uh, sufficient energy, um, uh, healthy food, clean air, as part of that transition to a new economy. Um, critically, I think is what we can do right now is actually set up some measures of success for our economy that may look a little different than traditional economic measures. How do we ensure that there are um, universal fundamental needs being met within the constraints of a healthy environment and also the global economic forces we have to live within? And even within those universal metrics, how, how do we always asking um, for whom and make sure the people most impacted are prioritized? Um, when we really focus on the folks that are most impacted by the crisis, we can uh, be sure that everyone is going to participate and have an opportunity in a new economy. Uh, so thank you, uh, that's my presentation.
Thank you so much, Derek. I, I really appreciate the, especially that pinwheel that really calls attention to how we create equitable economies and building a democratic economy as we get out of this recession or what it will take to get out of this recession. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, colleagues, we are right on time. We have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. And um, I know Council Member Sawant has some comments and questions that she'd like to make. I do have a quick question for um, Misha Worshkel. Uh, before you log off, I see you're still on. Uh, before I turn it over to Council Member Sawant, there is a question also from Dan Strauss, who is Council Member Strauss on the line. Um, and I just want to throw it in before you have to jump off. You mentioned this crisis will be worse unless we act fast. What methods of stimulus will be most equitable? And he also asked for Josh, you mentioned the recession usually begins with manufacturing and then goes to low wage um, jobs. We are seeing the beginning, this recession hitting low wage jobs first, understanding our previous stimulus plans were directed into a different type of recession. What specific stimulus programs should we invest in today? Similar questions. Just want to throw that out before turning it over to Council Member Sawant for her questions. Since you have to go, Misha, do you want to start real quick? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That's a great question. You know, I think um, I would say it's not just one thing that is needed. Um, the first kind of bare minimum is to keep the money flowing of public investments. So state and local governments have to continue to spend money on their employees, on the services that they're purchasing, on um, you know homelessness, crisis response, contracted services, the things that um, state and local governments are buying. We have to continue to spend that money and keep that money circulating in the the economy. Um, the other um, element that I think is really important is, well, actually two other elements briefly. One is from an equity perspective, filling the gaps from the federal government. So we know that the federal response so far has left out um, populations in some cases who were already um, excluded from our state and local systems, particularly undocumented immigrants. And so um, an equitable response has to prioritize um, filling those gaps so that the federal and the local works hand in hand to bring everybody forward. Um, and then finally, I think that um, from kind of a thinking big perspective in terms of responding to the magnitude of this crisis, I would urge local and um, elected officials and others to think about broad-based cash assistance strategies. So um, the cash assistance is something that can meet people's need in the immediate moment. It meets the different needs that different households have. And if targeted towards people based on income means that you know, as we start to reopen our economy, uh, folks will be able to shop at the small businesses and uh, go to the restaurants and continue to buy groceries and all of the things Things that help get our economy moving. And so um, really thinking big, broad-based cash assistance to reach um, you know, a significant portion of households in Seattle or across Washington state um, with ideally monthly cash payments until our economy is back on track. Great, thanks. Josh? Yeah, just quickly on the point that, you know, do the unique features of this recession sort of merit a, a different response than most other anti-recessionary responses, sort of. I mean, I would say one thing that really stands out is that our existing unemployment insurance system actually works okay for laid off manufacturing workers because they tend to be workers who have a lot of hours and have a pretty rich employment history and so tend to um, qualify for unemployment insurance. One of the very good things that the CARES Act did was try to expand our unemployment insurance system to capture workers like gig workers, those who have more irregular hours so they could actually be protected by a UI system that didn't normally protect workers like that. So that was one thing we had to do differently. And I think it recognized the fact that this was really starting with low wage sort of irregular workers in a way that the previous recessions hadn't. Um, we should make those permanent. We should have a UI system that it's always is much more protective than what we already um, have is, but I think it's those changes were uniquely suited for what we have now. And then the other thing, I, I mentioned it a little bit in my remarks, this is just a, a recession that is putting enormous demands on one narrow sector of the health, sort of, of the healthcare sector, but then is just causing a huge drop in spending. We've even seen layoffs of hospitals and doctor's offices, because if it's not COVID, it is not being taken care of right now, it's being deferred. And so I think what that means is public investments in health, not just for the obvious reason it fights the epidemic, but it also takes this incredibly 
talented group of workers who currently right now are not being used enough if they're in the healthcare sector and not doing COVID direct stuff and putting them to use. And so all of the money we can spend on public health interventions over the next year will be worth doing. Um, and I think that's something that would be a uniquely useful response to the recession we're in. I love both those answers. Thank you so much. Investments in health and investments in direct cash for ass uh, assistance for individuals in our community. Um, I am going to turn it over to Councilmember Sawant, and I thank Councilmember Strauss for sending in those messages. I know he's on YouTube. Thank you for watching from afar. Um, Councilmember Sawant, an economist in her own right, um, has some comments and I believe a question as well. Thank you so much, Councilmember Mosqueda, and I really appreciate all the speakers and their thoughtful presentations. First, I just wanted to highlight and sort of echo a crucial point that was made by Sherazad uh, when she talked about how recessions are used by corporations, uh, not only to, you know, not only our budget, existing budget starved, but I think a, a very important point that was made uh, by Sherazad was that corporations actually go uh, far further in their offensive during recessions uh, through waves of privatization. Uh, and I think that was mentioned, but uh, the other two uh, examples I'll mention also are the nearly 8 million foreclosures of working and middle-class homeowners in the decade uh, that's happened in the decade since the Great Recession and the savage attacks on public schools and the massive wave of privatization and education that happened in Louisiana following Hurricane Katrina. In each of these cases, the worst impact as we know was on the most vulnerable the working class and poor communities of color uh, also you know black and latino working and poor families being targeted uh, for foreclosures uh, and stealing their sort of you know home ownership equity uh, which is you know which has there's no prospect of that coming back uh, so that i just wanted to note that that's a very important component of our consideration as the city council thinks about policy making in this context my question is related to recessions versus job creation. I mean, we know corporations that would be taxed by progressive taxes always claim, no matter whether we're in a recession or not, that any corporate taxes would be a job killer. I think Lenore uh, provided good uh, argumentation for, you know, from an economic standpoint for why, uh, you know, that's not a reasonable position to have. But I also think that the graph from Josh, Josh Bivens told a powerful truth about how actually the recessionary periods are the big culprits for job killing. And it links to, I think, what we need to address the key, one of the key features of this recession. Obviously, the plummeting of local public budgets is one of the key features, and that has been addressed. You know, Lenore and Josh both explained how the creation of new progressive revenues through corporate taxes would provide an alternative to austerity and the cuts to public programs. But I wonder if you could also talk, Lenore and Josh, if you could also talk about how corporate taxes as a way, uh, ab talk about corporate taxes as a way to fund um, a counter to the other key feature of this recession, which is the joblessness. So, you know, using uh, progressive revenues through corporate taxes to actually create jobs through public works programs and uh, in, in, in the way that the new deal was created and how really that uh, was the backbone of helping working families come out of the Great Depression. Sure, I can take other, uh, And also if other speakers wanted to add to that, thank you. Yeah, thank you, that's a great point. I can take a quick, um, make one quick point about that. I, I'm doing some research right now on uh, public investment in home health care. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, if we had adequate investment in home health care right now, we could actually support, uh, depending on the scale of investment, tens of thousands, if not millions of jobs. In the next couple months and years of this crisis, home health care is going to be more important than ever as people stay in their home, look to stay in their homes uh, to avoid residential care facilities that have been fortunately been hotspots of COVID. Um, we also know that home health care workers are some of the most, uh, it's, it's one of the jobs that was actually projected to grow uh, most quickly over the coming decade, even before COVID. But because of our system, uh, families themselves are often left trying to figure out, you know, put together the patchwork of ways to bring workers into the home through some public support, paying out of pocket, et cetera. So if we had robust public investment in home health care and really care work more broadly, we would be able to do two things at once. One, we would meet a public health need of supporting people who are most um, 
vulnerable health-wise to COVID of staying in their homes, but two, we would be able to really create jobs robustly for a workforce that, as many have already said, uh, low-income uh, women, disproportionately people of color, disproportionately immigrant women who are home health care workers who have been um, most affected by the current shutdown. Um, and then, you know, we know that it's, it's the case that when people have employment or when their employment is stable, they then go out and spend money in the economy. They go when we are able to, to uh, restaurants, they purchase um, critical health needs for themselves, they purchase goods and services for their children. So I've been doing some calculations to look at the impacts and the, the effects of spending money on home health care would really have a very positive effects of then supporting uh, more employment created throughout the rest of the economy. So I think that's just one example I, I'm, is top of mind for me right now. Um, but I think more broadly, we know that that kind of public investment in care work and other sectors of the economy are really what we're going to need to stabilize things over the medium term. Yeah, and if I could jump in just really quickly, I, I think it's a really good observation that claims, whether it's like regulations or high taxes, that they will be job killers are pretty much always and everywhere bogus. The, the things that kill jobs are recessions and failure to, to get growth up again quickly. Um, even in sort of a narrow economic textbook term, that's right. I think that the there is some, you know, if you read the economic textbook, what is supposed to be the downside of higher corporate taxes is it's supposed to depress investment and lead to lower productivity. But even that, if you look in the years before the big corporate tax cut of 2017 was passed and you compare what corporations were doing before and after that tax cut, they didn't all, the start, all of a sudden start investing. They all of a sudden didn't make everything more productive after they got their corporate tax cut, they, they pocketed the money. All that happened when corporations taxes were cut in 2017 was their shareholders got richer. Jobs didn't jump, investment didn't jump, productivity didn't jump. It was a zero sum transfer to shareholders. Um, and that money can be better spent to support jobs and a more equitable outcome if you use it to finance things like public investment. So I totally agree with that. And I totally agree with the things that kill jobs are recessions and anything that helps end them, if that includes getting revenue from corporations to support state and local spending, you should do it. Excellent question. Thank you so much, Council Member Swan, and thank you, Dr. Palladino and um, Josh Biv uh, Bivens for your responses. Any other panelists have a comment before we take another question? Okay, great. Um, uh, Council Member Morales, is there a question from you at this time? Well, um, I want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us this morning and for sharing your, your insight into this. Um, as the chair of the Community Economic Development Committee for our city council, um, one of the things that we've been really uh, focused on is how we build community wealth. Um, and even before COVID, um, we were having a conversation about how we stop the displacement that's happening in our city, particularly in our communities of color, um, how we you know, adjust our land use code or, or financing mechanisms so that we can ensure that there's more community ownership of land, that our small businesses get access to capital so that they can buy their properties rather than risk them getting uh, pushed out. Um, particularly now, that conversation is even more important. And so um, I guess I would just ask if there's any uh, guidance you can provide about as a municipality, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, how we think about rebuilding our communities with resilience, how we increase the opportunity for folks to really have uh, have access to, to land, to capital, to um, the kinds of tools that allow them to really uh, remain in the city and, and not worry about how they get pushed out. I'll, I'll just say, and I think we have a community needs panel coming up, but the situation for, yeah, for communities, for community businesses, for residents is just one of increasing uncertainty right now. And, uh, you know, trickle of, of support that comes in, you know, $10,000 increments or whatnot is helpful to kind of stave off the immediate, but the, the future um, is, is tough. And so um, I think thinking about what a city can do and its, its powers, um, 
I think thinking about those kind of, you know, a centralized authority to maybe acquire things that are coming online to prevent them from going to kind of speculative real estate and move things into trust, providing uncertainty or certainty to community businesses around space and maybe taking on some, you know, master leasing uh, role. I think we're going to have to think differently about um, how individuals businesses operate and and how they might work a little bit more in a collective um, state um, because you know you talk about restaurants of losing you know a quarter of the restaurants in this nationally for data like that we have to think about how we can uh, preserve those institutions that are both um, you know businesses but also cultural institutions that are anchoring neighborhoods so looking at the full toolbox um, land use of uh, public development authorities to acquire space and I think is a great opportunity right now uh, as things progress. That's a great answer. I think it also touches on one of the questions we received. Um, we did have the opportunity for the public to send in questions ahead of time. One of the questions that we received I think speaks exactly to what Derek just asked and, and it says, in an uncompetitive housing market, lack of public transit and rent seeking um, by essential services due to constrained budgets has exacerbated our historic imbalance of power where labor is under the thumb of property owners. How can Seattle prevent from descending into a com company town where essential workers are fo forced to accept corporate conditions on their um, employment and lifestyles despite our $15 an hour minimum wage. And I think part of what you're saying, Derek, from Front and Center, is really investing in allowing uh, individuals, especially people of color, women, folks who've been historically left out to have access to the capital and to the property so that they can initiate their own um, self-sustainability uh, self, um, and um, uh, self-direction. Anything else to add to that before we move on to one more question? Seeing none, I will ask another question um, that came from our community. Um, and it is a question about um, the future crisis. So the COVID crisis, which has devastated our most vulnerable while leaving uh, our large corporations and richest unscathed in some instances better off, gives us a taste of the climate crisis to come. How can we not only fix these structural problems, but in the words of the people's bailout, also make a down payment on a regenerative economy while preventing future crises. So a lot of you spoke to this in your presentations. I'm just wondering if you have anything to add. It dovetails to one of the other questions. If not now, when? Can we finally get guaranteed rights to dwelling universal basic income or single payer medical care? Any comments on those large structural policies um, in addition to the comments you made earlier? Yeah, I'll just say absolutely. I think that we are in a moment, obviously you in Seattle can't do this on your own. It's going to take a national you know, movement building effort. And especially as we wait, uh, you know, as, as things are so stuck at the federal level, we really need cities and states to lead the way. I think that we um, can't think in sort of lanes anymore about we're gonna deal with housing over here, corporate power over here, workers' rights over here. We need um, comprehensive strategies. And I think that the more that you know, in the midst of a short-term crisis, we can really channel public investments towards the types of um, job creation and um, production strategies that are really going to allow us to have um, a, you know, a resilient and renewable economy in the future, the better. But that's going to take, I think, a real sustained uh, front and center focus from, from all of us. Excellent answer. I see nods on the Zoom. Anybody else have any closing comments on that before we turn it over to our expert panel from the community needs perspective? Last closing comment. Yes, Josh. really quickly. I, I agree totally with Lenore, and I and I would just say, you know, this crisis came from out of the blue, and it was it's horrible. The climate crisis is not coming from out of the blue. If we decide to be wise about this, we actually have time. It, it's, ticking for sure, but we have time. And I think a little bit like the, the we can't spend enough on public health interventions in the current moment. Um, same thing with climate. We have all the money in the world to fight this. We can do it. We should do it even if we have to take on debt to do it. That should not be a, a something that um, makes people nervous. That is what debt is for. It's an incredibly long run investment and so it'll pay off. And so I think all the excuses should have 
hopefully by now faded away and it's time and there's just no reason not to do it. Thank you for those words of encouragement and motivation and for all of the research that you've shared with us today, folks. We do hope you're able to stay with us on the line. If you have to drop off, we completely understand. I think part of the context that you helped us shape is the result of the economic crisis has put into sharp focus the inequities that our system already had at the local level in our city and across the state and country, as we saw from the um, data that you all shared. Many of us are searching for solutions. And as we search for those solutions that you have just articulated, we know we must put those who are directly impacted at the heart, at the center of any policy solutions. Um, as we transition to the next panel, I want to read um, a New York Times opinion piece that was just published uh, this week. It starts with, lately, some commentators have suggested that the coronavirus lockdowns pits an affluent professional class, comfortable, staying home, indefinitely against a working class more willing to take the risk for doing their job. This assumption underlying this generalization, however, are not based on even a cursory look at actual data. In a recent Washington Post survey, 74% of respondents agreed that the US should keep trying to slow the spread of the uh, coronavirus, even if that means keeping many businesses closed. And agreement was slightly higher, 79% among respondents who had been laid off or furloughed. So I wanna put that into context to make sure that we're um, dismantling any false narratives that have been put out that somehow uh, keeping the economy closed is bad for workers or somehow is a schism between elites and the working class. I think what we, that survey shows is that the very folks who are at most risk right now are the people who are going to work and the folks who are calling for, in many cases, a reopening of the economy from President Trump on down are the folks who aren't going to be put in harm's way. I wanted to center our conversation on the folks who've been the essential workers who put their lives on the, um, on the line every day to drive the buses or as Sean's members um, do every day, go out and care for folks in the community at our libraries. Um, and as Beto will talk about, you know, his members who are small businesses really Really trying to stay afloat when their brick and mortar shops or their um, food trucks, for example, are closed down. Um, Colleen Echohawk, who's talk, who has on a daily basis seen the consequences of people not having access to the housing that they need. And Michelle Thomas, who for a long time has been talking about the um, depletion of housing, affordable housing across the city and the region and the consequences that afford that um, are being exposed now with COVID showing how critical it is that people get economic support so they can stay in housing and get into housing because you can't stay healthy if you can't stay home and you can't stay home if you have no home. So I want to thank all of the panelists who have joined us here today um, to talk about what this really looks like from your perspective on the ground level. Nothing without, nothing about us without us is a common saying in the labor movement and we need to make sure that any uh, reform efforts, um, revenue efforts, uh, attempts to address the crisis that is COVID in the near term, again, near, near term being defined within the next two to three years and the long term after that really do um, center our um, response on what you've experienced. So thank you for being here with us to help make these policy decisions, um, to help inform future conversations and to be really our experts at the, at the ground level. So we'll start with Beto Yarse. He's executive director from Ventures Nonprofit who will walk through what the impacts of COVID has been on um, the small businesses he's working with, especially small business owners who are women and people of color and how that has affected, how COVID has affected uh, your, your members and what you're experiencing at the ground level. Beto, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Muchas gracias. So I will be very short about this presentation as I already presented before to you guys. But I will just say um, that what we have been working in the 25 years as an organization that is a community development financial institution, Ventures offer uh, support to low-income entrepreneurs to help them to move out of poverty. And over all these years, we've been providing a lot of like the technical assistant training, coaching, incubation, and the, what I call the cherry on the top is access to capital. So constantly we hear access to capital is a solution for micro small business, but not only that, they need to access to the whole ecosystem. So we've been doing this work for many, many years. So in response of COVID-19, so we actually have to do it more now because the work that we've been doing for all these years might be just be erased. 
uh, all these uh, work that we have in progress uh, supporting these communities of color, immigrants, refugees, uh, Latinx community, women are the most vulnerable. I'm talking about the micro small businesses, the one to five employees, the mom and pops, your favorite bakery, your favorite micro space at the Pikeless Market, where places that you go and say, okay, I'm gonna grab a coffee every morning. Those are the places who are in really, really danger right now. And most of those clients are, or most of those businesses are our clients. So what I really think that the, the, the resources that our community need the most right now is really investing in what I call creative capital. Creative capital is not just access to loans. Uh, ventures already provide those, but we need to be more creative as a community of like, what did that looks like? If this business who were already low income and then you just providing a loan, putting on debt is not gonna help them. So you, we need to make sure that we invest on them. And then when I say, I've been hearing a lot of the stabilization fund from the city of Seattle, Ventures have their own micro grant program that we distributed more than 120 micro grants to 60 businesses. So those are grants. Those are money that it will help businesses to continue being operating and thriving. But what is the missing piece in this creative capital is like how do we're helping these businesses with coaching, training, how do you pivoting when these processes, you are investing $10,000 or $500 or 2,500, whatever is the creative capital, but how you are helping this business to manage that money in the best way, in that way they're prepared for the new normal, for the new future of doing business, especially in micro small businesses. So that's one of the pieces of what I'm hearing of what is needed. So also another question that I see out there is like, what did that looks like to recover? What is really what we need to kind of review or recover? And so when are we gonna be reopened and what is exactly what I need? So community development financial institution, Ventures is a community development financial institution. We are already doing a lot of these trainings and co uh, programs on how do businesses are preparing for reopening. What do they need? What is this needs work? What is all these things that they are really requiring? And when you are overwhelmed trying to survive, that you don't have time to read all these articles. So we are trying to put together all this information in a very basic workshop. We're offering Tuesdays and Fridays workshops about specific things to our, our members and our clients to get ready and prepare to reopen. Uh, even for people who have access to the resources, like I consider myself that I have access to a lot of resources and then I get all this information. I get overwhelmed on how we're gonna reopen our store. We have a store at Pipe Place Market. They incubate 80 businesses. And when I read all the new regulations and all what we need to do, I feel like, oh my God, how we're gonna do that? So that's one of the pieces that I really kind of trying to be very strategic on how we are gonna rebuild and making sure that all these businesses. And it, early on, we talk a little bit about like, this is also an opportunity to invest in how these businesses, they are already being displaced or they were gonna be displaced because the gentrification and then all the things that were happening in our city, in our state. So how do we use this as an opportunity to really invest in spaces for this business to, to thrive and, and, and making sure that they stay and they offer the best things that we love. Um, so one thing that I've been really thinking is also we are going to have to be very mindful about what is the campaign that we want to use, kind of being intentional with our money when we are going to be out there and spending. So I've been hearing a lot of like, this is an opportunity to spend small business. We have a couple campaigns a year, like, you know, the after Black Friday is a small business Saturday in November. And in May, we have a small business week. But that's it, what we have been doing as supporting a small business. So from now on, I think it's going to be very important for us to be very intentional about how we spend our money and how do every penny that we spend, uh, because our businesses are really pivoting. I have m multiple clients that they're pivoting. Like I was receiving my mask today. Actually, I just want to share it. Like one of our clients is pivoting her business. Her name is uh, Other People's Polyester and she make beautiful gowns and she now is making fashionable uh, masks. So 
And then she was able to change that because we were able to help her with the technical assistance, the training and pivoting her business. So we're gonna need more of that in order for us to rebuild these micro small businesses. Uh, and I'm talking about the one to five solopreneurs. And then from the 28 million businesses who are in our nation, 22 are solopreneurs, 22 million. So we always think about small businesses are like, a, like this is the micro small businesses which we need to support. Uh, I will I will just continue thinking about like other businesses who are pivoting uh, Los Agaves at the Pipers Market. They are pivoting and using their commercial kitchen and making meals for the health uh, uh, workers. Uh, time well spent with Chantel Jackson. She is also providing meals. So they are trying to to survive this. And the way they are pivoting their business is because they have coaches and mentors like ventures to support them. Not everybody have that. And especially when you come from an underserved uh, group. And the last one that I'm just gonna advocate is those who have been left out for many years on the immigrants, uh, undocumented families. I always been an advocate for that because I was undocumented myself. And I was able to start my own business with $250 and I was able to grow it for a large business like a smaller large business uh, with any documents so but I didn't get any support from the federal or the state because I didn't qualify for any of the programs so we need to make sure that we we advocate for those immigrants who are undocumented with IT number and ventures offer loans and credit capital and other programs are available for those undocumented so I will just make a pause there and and because I know I just have only five minutes and I don't want to Take more time. I continue talking about our businesses, but I will just make a pause for now. Thank you so much, Beto. And I know that there will probably be some questions for you. I really appreciate your time and all that you're doing on behalf of your members. Um, the next presenter is going to be Sean Van Eyck. He's an organizing representative with Protect 17, who represents um, workers and members within the city of Seattle. I know, Sean, as we talk about austerity, many of your members have um, survived and been sort of uh, the, the, the consequences of past austerity efforts. And I think that the conversation that's gearing up again around austerity is, is really troubling and hitting people hard. Can you talk a little bit um, from your perspective about what you'd um, like to see in terms of um, investments in the public sector based on sort of the presentation that we heard and what does uh, what do you think are some consequences uh, to us not doing investments in public programs uh, like we've seen in the past? Sure, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to this. This has been a very insightful and uh, enlightening forum. So thank you for that. Um, um, as you mentioned, I am uh, a union representative with Protect 17. We are the largest uh, union of city employees at the city of Seattle, but we have a footprint all over the state and in the state of uh, in uh, the, the city of Portland as well. Uh, and so we've been during the crisis uh, interacting with our, our internally staff on a daily basis, talking about what our respective municipalities have been doing, um, and it's been actually quite enlightening. Um, Leading up to the crisis, we were, you know, just come off of a contract cycle where we negotiated a fantastic new contract with the city, and uh, we're really focusing our efforts on internal equity and uh, on um, and expanding some benefits, particularly around leave for city employees. And in the near term, during the crisis, uh, right at the very beginning, we started negotiating and just uh, negotiated and should be legislating soon a an MOU that's a COVID MOU that's short term that addresses uh, the primary concerns our members have in the near term, which is making sure that the highest risk employees have uh, access to not only the continued health care benefits, but also continued wages um, uh, during the, the crisis so that they're not, um, not facing a lot of the same crises that other folks in the private sector are right now. Um, also trying to make sure that we're uh, touching on and using this as an opportunity to expand existing benefits. So one of the things that we were anticipating bargaining later this year uh, in the new contract was a reopener on um, the expanded uh, state sick leave benefits and uh, integrating that into the city benefits. And we were looking specifically around top off, being able to utilize leave benefits that they had already accrued to top off the state benefits so they have a full wage replacement. And I'm happy to report that the MOU that we just negotiated actually fast-tracked that for purposes of the new uh, federal leaves that um, were, uh, were enacted uh, under the CARES Act. Um, so that's been a near-term solution. Um, we have yet to have any conversations uh, with the city around any near-term uh, furloughs or, or layoffs, although we have suggested 
and did suggest very early on that uh, now was the time to start looking at near-term furloughs with the expanded unemployment benefits and partic particularly around looking at how we could equitably do uh, maybe not full on furloughs of weeks at a time, but hours reductions that would allow people to apply for unemployment and thereby uh, not only getting full wage replacement at certain wage rates, but also being able to get access to that additional $600 a week between now and the end of July. Um, with the goal of not only doing it equitably, but putting more money in people's pockets, because as many of the speakers presented here today said, uh, pointed out, rightfully so, that the way you keep the economy going is not by throwing money at large corporations that are just shuttering their doors anyway, it's by putting money in people's pockets so they can stimulate the economy. Um, you know, and, and so we are absolutely uh, on the same, same side in terms of uh, resistance to austerity. We know it doesn't work. The data shows it doesn't work. And the concern is that the, we're not just talking about reducing public works and it, it, it's a two, sides, two sides of the same coin. It's one, you're, we wanna keep our public employees employed so that they are uh, participating in that economy and functioning and, and helping prop it up. But they're also delivering essential services and a vast majority of city employees have been deemed essential uh, workers uh, under, under the directives. So, um, and we wanna see an expansion of that. Now is the time to, to explore uh, how we integrate a Green New Deal and expand public uh, public works uh, and create new jobs. Um, and uh, so we, that's, that's the direction our organization has been taking. I know we've had internal conversations around leveraging this crisis at the, st um, at the state level um, and trying to push the legislature to really overhaul our exceptionally regressive tax uh, system and put more money into, uh, into public works. Um, and so we are, we are very much anticipating a conversation with the city around furloughs and layoffs in the near term, but we are also at the same time strongly, strongly pushing for filling the revenue holes and actually expanding revenue uh, for the city and other municipalities where we have the footprint. Sean, thank you so much. I know we'll have more conversations to come about uh, potential furloughs and cuts, but I appreciate you underscoring support for uh, a progressive revenue package so that we really can avoid the austerity that we've seen in the past. Thank you for sharing your perspective and for all that your members are doing right now to care for our city and our residents. Um, the next presenter is Michelle Thomas, Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance who will discuss the most important strategies to responding to COVID in light of the ongoing affordable housing crisis that existed prior to the pandemic and how the COVID's response should look given those housing concerns. Thanks Michelle for being with us today and for all the work you do in Olympia and locally. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Um, so first I'll just highlight some pre-COVID um, facts. I think we all know that Washington state had before COVID hit a really significant homelessness crisis with unsheltered homelessness at its most acute in King County in Seattle. This is directly related to three pre-COVID problems that remain and that we anticipate will remain throughout the recovery. Rents are far out of reach of low-income renter households. Uh, our state and our region in particular in King County has severe income inequality with rents pegged at the highest incomes, um, again, far out of reach of lower income renter households. And we have a massive shortage of the affordable homes that we need, especially of permanent supportive housing, which is the solution to unsheltered long-term homelessness. The region lacks 6,500 permanent supportive housing uh, units that we need to solve long-term unsheltered homelessness. Pre-COVID, our state and region also had a significant shortage of shelter beds, which is, um, the shelter system largely relies on a congregate care setting in which people all sleep next to many other individuals. Meanwhile, sweeps of homeless encampments are routine across the state and are continuing during this pandemic, including in Seattle. Pre-COVID, um, the homeless prevention resources that we had both at the state, county, and uh, local level, city level, uh, far um, uh, un the demand for those were far outpacing. Um, <laughs> we didn't have enough resources, sorry. They were overwhelmed. Um, the need for rental assistance and homelessness assistance far exceeded the resources available. Um, and that has been made worse during this pandemic. And of course, pre-COVID, people of color disproportionately experienced homelessness and housing instability. 
People of color are more likely to be renters in Washington state and therefore are vulnerable to rent increases and the weaknesses in our state's landlord tenant laws that allow landlords to arbitrarily evict tenants. 69% of black households rent in Washington state compared to only 33% of white households. 57% of Hispanic or Latino households are renters in Washington and 66% of native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander households are renters. The disproportionate experience of homelessness in Washington state is illustrated in our state's count of students in the public school system who are experiencing homelessness. 62% of the students in our public school system experiencing homelessness are students of color. And one in every 10 African-American or black students experienced homelessness in Washington state compared to only one in every 38 white students. So during COVID, we know that all of these issues are likely to be, to be exasperated. Unless of course, we have um, the federal, state and local response that is swift and lasts throughout the duration of the crisis. The moratorium on evictions that the city and state has enacted are absolutely essential. Many tenants are struggling to make um, ends meet and 250,000 people in our state have applied for unemployment insurance and have yet to see a dime. And that's really critical because there's a growing discourse out in the public that why are people unable to pay their rent? We have a robust unemployment system. We had uh, federal dollars come in from the CARES Act to individuals. Um, and so there's an assumption that people are just choosing not to pay their rent and that's absolutely not true. Um, it's really great and appreciated that the city has extended the moratorium on evictions, thank you. But the state's moratorium expires on June 4th and without a renewal or without a significant rental assistance program to meet the extraordinary need throughout our region, we expect to uh, see significant increase in homelessness throughout the region. And the need for rental assistance is really great. King County 211, which is the clearinghouse most people are referred to um, if they're in need of resources, has experienced a 231% increase in requests compared to February. Um, at the same time, the United Way home-based program that rolled out in April for King County received 6,841 6, direct applications for rental assistance and the funds dried up in two days. Thank you to the city for appropriating some of your CARES Act dollars um, from, that the city has received from the federal government for rental assistance but it's clear that the need is far exceeding the demand um, and that the city will need assistance from the state and federal government as well. The HEROES Act that was passed by Congress last Friday includes significant funding that could equate to about $2 billion in Washington state if the Senate um, agrees to pass it without amendments. And this is on par with about what we think, uh, we and the national experts think is needed for Washington state. Also, I just want to point out that the state is actually currently deciding on how to appropriate uh, $1.6 billion from the CARES Act federal appropriation to the state. And we are asking that the state um, use a significant portion of that for rental assistance needs throughout the state. It would be really helpful if local governments made similar requests to the governor. So on homelessness, we know that homelessness is deadly. Uh, but COVID dramatically increases the risk. Recent reports indicate that homeless individuals infected by COVID-19 are roughly twice as likely to be hospitalized, two to four times as likely to require critical care, and two to three times as likely to die as the general population. But in Washington state currently, we have significantly reduced our shelter capacity. It uh, is estimated that shelter capacity in Washington state, and this does include King County, is reduced by an estimated of 30%, it may be higher. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we've learned that the congregate care setting that most shelters rely on is unsafe and it will remain, it will remain unsafe until COVID no longer exists or until there is a working vaccine that people experiencing homelessness have access to. Um, also, homelessness resources in our state are at risk. Um, Pre-COVID, like I said, uh, the need far exceeded um, the available resources. But if demand increases for those resources as we predict, and if investments in those resources decrease, the need um, and the gap is gonna be severely exasperated. It's also really important to know that the state's primary source for funding homelessness resources is a document recording fee on real estate transactions and the state is currently predicting a very steep decline in that resource. 
We don't have numbers on that yet. We expect to see more data in the coming month. Um, but right now, the terms that the state is using is um, catastrophic loss of resources for homelessness. Um, we also know that because um, renter households are disproportionately lower income, that they will be slower, slower to experience any benefits from an economic recovery. Therefore, as things begin to look like they're recovering for the public at large, we need to understand that low income renter households will lag behind and will need um, continued supports in order to experience any recovery that others begin to experience. Um, I just want to close with saying that we don't want to return to our pre-COVID housing crisis. That's not what we should be aiming for. We need a different way forward that centers equity and rebuilds a housing system and an economic system that meets the needs of all households. As many of the speakers today have already said, um, the economy was already failing people far before COVID hit. We need a fully funded homelessness response system that can quickly step in to prevent households from falling into homelessness when they experience an economic emergency. And we need to continue to move forward to deeply invest in the affordable housing needs of our region and of our state. We have a significant gap in affordable housing and we cannot allow the COVID economic downturn to set us further behind. We need this all funded with progressive and sustainable revenue at the state and regional level. And of course, we need to improve renter protections so that people can stay in their homes. So thank you for what the city has done. Thank you so much, um, Councilmember Mosqueda, for putting together this panel today. It's been really informative. Thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate it. And I think you've framed the conversation um, extremely well for our presenter from Chief Seattle Club, Colleen Echohawk, Executive Director for Chief Seattle Club. You see this every day as you're out in the community caring for folks who are unsheltered. How has COVID been, how has COVID COVID worsened the experience of being unsheltered and what remediation strategies would you like to see? Yeah, well, thank you so much. It's um, an honor to be here and to be with such a wonderful um, group of presenters. Uh, the Chief Seattle Club has been open every single day. Um, we have not had um, a stop of our services. We've had to change things tremendously. Um, and I think that has been incredible. We see that all over the region where people are pivoting, changing, being flexible and ensuring that we serve some of our most incredible community members. I am at our day center once a week in solidarity with my staff who um, are out there. And I just wanna make a quick note that some of our homeless um, services provide and our providers are frontline work, they are frontline workers. They need PPE. Um, e. um, I'm grateful that um, in partnership with the Seattle Health Board that we have PPE for our staff, but that is a big concern um, we have um, a tremendous amount of folks who have been suffering pri uh, um, prior to COVID-19 and are, their suffering now is greater. I wanna um, just give you a picture of what it's like in Pioneer Square right now. So I, was, uh, I worked uh, last Wednesday morning and um, we fed about 200 people. We generally um, do all of our food inside, but now we're doing it outside to keep people safe as much as we can. And what I saw is that we are seeing this, the symptoms and the uh, terrible aftermath of not having um, an adequate mental health care system in our, in our region. Um, I saw folks who um, were, were hallucinating, um, who were experiencing incredible mental um, health distress. And um, my, my continued just uh, feeling in my, in my heart and my spirit is that they, they are experiencing so much suffering um, and, the, and the suffering is exasperated by COVID-19. They are hearing about this um, virus. They're afraid of the virus. It is contributing to anxiety, PTSD. And I wanna focus the rest of my time on what, what should we do? What is an equitable response to what is going on now? We've heard a lot of data. Um, we've heard a lot of um, inform information, but I think that what I wanna, um, um, invite us to think about is that in, in order to have an equitable response to COVID-19, we need to have solutions that are led by the community. And we've heard that POC folks, the working class community, are those folks who are going to have, who are, who are suffering at greater rates because of COVID-19. 
That means that we have to listen to them. That means we have to ensure that they are at the table. One thing that um, I think about all the time is, and this does not come from me, uh, but um, it, was a, it was a meme on the internet. Um, and, and this meme said, you know, in order to have equal responses, we have to think about that table. Um, in the native community, what we'd like to do with that table is break it down and create a sweat lodge and invite all of us to come into that sweat lodge and learn from each other. And I, I wanna invite us to be thinking about that story. That st that we know that these tables were mostly not made for people of color. We're mostly not made for a community that is, that is, is, is really struggling right now. And so if we wanna think about equity during this COVID response, we have to take extraordinary measures to hear from the community. We have to do things we've never done before. We have to fund the na um, native communities, black communities, our um, Latinx communities and ensure that um, we are, are enabling them to find the solutions that will work for their community because culturally appropriate, appropriate services are part of the answer that we're looking for as we, as we um, think about COVID response. And as you can tell, I'm excited about this because it, it is essential and it will be, it's life-saving measures is what we're talking about now. One thing that when Beto was sharing, my, my dear friend Beto, good to see you Beto. One thing that I heard in your comments was that we have to be trauma aware in our response. Um, I know of a, of a certain, uh, I know of, an, an, a, of some people in our native community that the doing, App applying for unemployment benefits is scary. It triggers all kinds of PTSD. It triggers all kinds of generational historical trauma. So if we know that that is the case and we know that there are, there are people who are not accessing some of these services, then we have to figure out ways to make sure that those services and those applications become anti-racist and become um, um, trauma aware and, and ensure that, that folks are getting equal access. Um, I also want to say that I'm on two different COVID-19 um, responses, commit, uh, coalitions. One of them, uh, probably 80% of the folks participating are um, white men. Um, the other is like almost 95% POC folks. And I appreciate both of those coalitions. They both want to do good things. But if we cannot find ways to come together and talk about how um, how we see this um, COVID-19 response being equitable, then um, I think that we're gonna really miss out on an amazing opportunity. I'll say too that the other concern I have is that the coalition that is 80% white men, they are incredibly powerful people. They know the right people. They have um, access to power. They can call the governor anytime they want to. And I think that is um, of concern. I'm glad I can be there, glad that I can represent but I think that we need to um, find tables where all voices can be heard um, and, and that we, uh, we are incredibly active in finding ways to um, break down these policies that were not set up for POC communities to um, succeed. And so I think this is an incredible opportunity for the city of Seattle. Um, I think that we have a city council that we I could not have imagined of 20 years ago. And I look forward to seeing what um, what that means for our community. I think that Seattle has been at the um, front of this um, crisis and the way we respond now is incredibly important. And we, we have an opportunity to lead the, the country and on what it means to have an equitable response to this crisis. So thank you, Councilman Mosqueda. I could go on for a long time about this, but I appreciate the opportunity to um, share just a little bit about what I'm learning. Thank you so much, Colleen Echohawk, again, Executive Director of Chief Seattle Club. Um, thank you to this panel, uh, esteemed experts from the community who've given us perspectives from small business, housing advocates, folks who are working in the public sector and folks who are working with those who are unsheltered. Um, this has been an incredible presentation. I got a note from our communications team that we had over 200 people uh, viewing this presentation uh, throughout the time and wanna just say thank you for all of your time. We have a few questions for some, or a few opportunities for follow-up questions. Um, and I, I know that you all have been uh, pulled in various directions um, and asked to provide feedback repeatedly. Um, I think the, the biggest concern uh, that we have, uh, that we've heard 
is maybe ties into all of these issues. I'm going to ask a question about childcare and Beto, feel free to chime in because I'm it's going to be specific to um, to uh, small businesses, but also I think it affects all of your members. You know, we have people who've been asked to be part of the essential workforce. And even at the city level, we provided zero assistance for infants and toddlers. The Children's Alliance gave me a call and said, well, it's great that there was this um, uh, renewed effort to try to make sure that essential workers had childcare. They were very concerned about no childcare for infants and toddlers. And um, I'm wondering, if you all could comment about sort of the childcare infrastructure, if there's been a conversation among your members about the need to make sure as we think about reinvesting in the economy, direct cash assistance as folks have called for, trusting communities, especially low wage workers or folks who are unsheltered and the organizations they work with, just trusting people with those cash assistance dollars is the first thing that we've heard. And then have you heard conversations from community members about the need for childcare at all? Can you comment on that? Definitely, some of the things that I see even in the nonprofit sector, like many of our workers are being facing those challenges on how the childcare system is not really working for people of color, minorities, like people who are low income. And Teresa, you and I, we have a conversation, I think a year ago, of what would it look like when we build infrastructure for childcare where a small business, like really small business, were be leading the, the, the service and then it would be a very more equitable, like people who are looking for a job and looking, and we already have multiple businesses that we have helped at uh, ventures with childcare providers who are offering uh, culturally appropriate services. They are starting their own business. It's like a helping two, two sectors, like people who need affordable childcare, but also people who are opening their own businesses. So, and I feel that that's a great opportunity for us to see if we are going to reveal the new services for childcare, how can we serve two groups? People who want to start a business, but also like affordable childcare. With also, I will put the cherry on the top of like what it will look like if you go and bring your your kid to a place that is like a multicultural, multilingual. That it's like we do have a lot of great communities, immigrant communities, Latinx, East Africans, Vietnamese. That they can provide some of that. And I already see that with some of our clients who are being very successful and like a Spanish immersion, what do that looks like? It's not, it's just like after school program, but it's a childcare and it's affordable, but not everybody can afford to have an after school is managing Spanish immersion. So those are just one thoughts about childcare, what I hear. Yeah, especially as we ask folks to come back to work, but there is no school or summer programs for people to put their kiddos into, I think that puts people in impossible positions. Any other comments on that? Council member Swant was, oh yes, go ahead, uh, Sean. Sorry, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, no, uh, I would just say um, echoing that, that's that certainly been a, a plea from our membership around um, being creative and flexible about the implementation of various leaves, particularly the new emergency leaves, uh, since some of them are the one, the, 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 the um, emergency family leave actually specifically available for, for that. and. Um, you know, with schools being out, uh, we have had lots of members come forward and say, I really want to have access to that so that I can take a couple hours a day and follow Seattle Public Schools guidance on homeschooling. And unfortunately, right now, the city's systems don't allow for folks to take that leave in anything less than one day chunks. Um, but I have had assurances from the systems folks, um, and we've actually got a demand to bargain in uh, this week um, to put pressure on the city to implement the ability to access those leaves in one hour chunks which would, uh, leading into the fall and the uncertainty around school um, would be a huge, huge improvement for members. So that's that's another thing that is absolutely top of mind for our members and we're pushing for. Excellent. Any other thoughts or closing comments or questions? Yes, Beto. Uh, people is, are been texting me about the name of the business that I share about the mask. Good. <laughs> it's other, other People's Polyester. And they, uh, I don't know, we'll just like, it's beautiful. And it's, um, so their website, it's allppclothing.com. So you will supporting someone and it's locally and then she does everything recycle and then she sends you the samples. So I'm just taking advantage to promote one of our ventures clients as always. So thank you, Beto. Appreciate and thank you for the invitation, Teresa, and putting all this. And it was a pleasure to share all of all with all of you. 
Absolutely. Um, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I want to thank Councilmember Sawant for hanging out with us. I know Councilmember Morales had to log off. We had Councilmember Strauss and Herbold viewing on YouTube um, at various points. So thank you to our colleagues for joining with us. I want to thank the IT team that made this all possible, the communication team and my team um, from my office, Aretha, Faride, Aaron, and Sejal Parikh. Um, we have a number of people who had sent us questions. Uh, we're happy to send around follow-up questions. If you email us at teresa.mosqueda at seattle.gov, we will follow up with you. Um, all the folks who presented today, we will have their PowerPoint presentation shared and a link to this recorded video. A special thanks to the experts from the community panel who've just concluded here today for all of the time. I know you were very busy responding to the immediacy of the COVID crisis. Thank you for sharing uh, your feedback, lessons learned, the analysis um, on how we act locally and to our previous panel, national experts and local experts on the economy. We know that from your presentation, we need to ensure that any recovery policies um, are inclusive of everyday workers, small and medium-sized businesses so that we can participate in the local economy. We need to reignite our economic growth by investing in um, dollars into the local economy to spur activity, to get dollars in hand, especially for our lowest wage folks. Um, and um, as Colleen has said, folks who've been left out of not just the policymaking table, but making sure that we get folks into the sweat lodge as we think about a recreating uh, economic growth in a new um, way so that we're not just reinvesting in, in failed economies of the past. We heard from the first uh, panelists as well that this crisis cannot, meet, cannot be met with austerity budgeting any effort to respond to the crisis with deep cuts at the very time when people need services the most in the from the public sector will only compound the pain and make it last longer. We've heard today that history tells us that austerity is the wrong approach and will only perpetuate this crisis. And that the goal of local government should not be just survival. The objective for local government should be to put us in a stronger position to respond to this crisis, to help the most vulnerable, to reinvest in a more equitable economy and to help our residents recover and thrive. Uh, we know that this pandemic has inevitably, inevitably made an inequitable economy worse, um, but working with you as we as we craft a recovery effort, as we renew our commitment to progressive revenue, and as we invest in um, uh, policies and um, the strategies to respond to the crisis, we need to think that the short term is a two to three year plan and that the longer term must be um, five, 10 years out. As we do that, we will make sure that we have re-engaged with all of you on an ongoing basis. Thanks again for all of your time. Colleagues, uh, we will post this link on our social media platforms. And just once again, thank you from the bottom of our hearts as you care for your communities and your families during this time of COVID. Our heart goes out to those who've lost loved ones to the COVID crisis and who are still suffering with the consequences of the illness as we um, try to take on the illness that has been imposed and made worsened um, in our local economy by COVID. Appreciate all of your time. And with that, we will let you go. Stay home, stay healthy and take care.